I did the first episode with uh, J.W. Verrett, who's, you know, regulatory guy out of D.C., and I didn't really give him the chance to introduce himself. I felt kind of yeah. bad for that. Just want to give you a chance, <laughs> yeah. introduce yourself, you know, what part of crypto, what part of the crypto ecosystem are you working in? And like, yeah, just we'll start off there. Yeah, for sure. So uh, I'm a Latin reggaeton artist. I go by Excelencia, La like X as well. I've been in the music industry for about 10 years or so. I always like to say about 10 years because that's when I really kind of took it serious, started investing in my career, kind of growing it out. Um, I got into crypto, I want to say like 2016, but I kind of consider myself class of like 2017. Uh, and I've been building in Web3 for the last two years as a as an artist, mostly in Web3 music and music NFTs. Awesome. So let's like, let's just segue right into that. So like, what is the, yeah. what is the, the opportunity and kind of like the reason that an artist because web3 music is very new and i think like i was kind of, even as a fan which i am a fan of and i like mentioned that before but it's only really been around for like two years right so very new ecosystem why would an artist what is the opportunity for someone to like dive into web3 as a as a recording artist yeah so um i, I would go back to like 2016 at least when i discovered it like at that time i was building a label and a publisher so i was kind of looking for an edge i'm kind of thinking about how could i use technology to my advantage like not just a website and not just like have a name and like distribute artists i kind of wanted to find something new that i could use um you know kind of like as a competitive advantage basically and i remember coming across like um spotify acquiring media chain and that at the time, that was very early. That was like 2016. And then there was also like the Berkeley Open Music Initiative. And they were looking at how to use blockchain technology and smart contracts to basically disrupt the music supply chain. So anything that had to do with like royalties and those inefficiencies, because a lot of times artists were getting paid like net 60, net 90, sometimes a year later. You know, so it's like, it's like an, a complex system. And they were looking for ways to basically kind of simplify it, right? So that was of interest to me, but that was really early. Then I came across Ethereum and this idea of building applications outside of the traditional system. And um, that's what definitely kind of got me in. And then I started seeing artists kind of tap into the idea of fundraising on the blockchain. So of course, crypto was global, accessible 24 seven. So that was of, uh, of interest. Um, and I think for artists like coming in over the years, we've seen like, we've, we've heard it before, kind of like the labels exploiting the artists in a sense. Um, this, the streaming platforms, kind of like how low the payouts are and how inefficient they are. It's not sustainable to scale an artist. So like for artists coming into the space, it, I always say it's like more of a mental model and like a like a mindset shift because it's it's mostly about ownership, right? Like that's not really pushed in the music industry up, up until now, at least, right? Like ownership, being independent, being your own like small business. Like for me, I'm structured as a label, even though I'm an artist. So you know, I own my masters, my publishing, I'm able to have this like creative freedom. And like, I think that's not new, but like, I feel like because of COVID and like Web3, it's like accelerating that idea. So it makes the artist kind of like the owner, it makes the artist a platform and you can kind of go through that, like have that direct relationship with the fan basically. So like, let's dive deeper into that. Is it like ownership from a fan standpoint? Like I own music NFTs. Like I kind of look at them as like digital, the digital format of like, what a record used to be like when right. my dad was buying records in like the seventies, I kind of look yeah. at it that way. Is that what you mean from an ownership standpoint? Are you like peeling it back like a level deeper from an artist perspective? Cause what I'm hearing is that it's like, you are your own label and you don't have to go through a label anymore because of this new right, exactly, technology. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you're like eliminating, you know, the third party, the middleman, the, all of that. And I, I think like when you think about a master nowadays, the recording, like you have the file, but, I always give this example, like I, I export from the software, I have this file on my computer and then I can copy and paste that a million times, but which one is the source, right? The, the actual original file in, in a digital world, like it's, it's really hard, but then through an NFT, through tokenizing it, it's kind of like the digital property rights, right? Like that conversation. And I think that's interesting. So the NFT can technically in the future represent like the master uh, on the recording side and the composition side. Um, back in the day, like you were saying, the records, you had that master vinyl and then from there, they would go ahead and print copies of the vinyl. So that was kind of like what the master was. And then, of course, the agreement. Um, but nowadays, it's like, what really represents it? Like, it's just an agreement, maybe on DocuSign. It's time stamped every time somebody looks at it or like signs it. And there's no actual tangible way to kind of verify like the ownership. 
So I, I love this idea of the NFT being the, the property rights for the master, so to speak. Okay, that's a really interesting way to look at it. And then from that perspective, I know some artists will sell sell their music as an NFT, right? Let's say they sell 25 editions of the song because you can sell like one to one. So let's let, before we I ask that question, let's just dive into like that difference. What's the difference between a one to one music NFT and then buying like one of 25 or one of 50 editions? Yeah. So like I, I look at it as like just different models. So like there's different platforms that have different models and ways of selling the NFT or having people collect it. Um, I think with editions, it's more like inclusive. You can access uh, more people, build a, a larger community. If you're looking for more collectors, that's that's one way to do it. Um, I had this conversation the other day where I, I kind of also look at those models as like, it's interesting. I have music that I want to put out as a one of one, but then there's music that I kind of want to put out as like uh, editions. Like, so, you know, it's like the idea of like limited, limited editions. Um, the one of one, they kind of call it like that canonical version where it's like, you know, the super rare, like very unique, that one version, um, you know, you can use that to, to raise capital. You can use that to create experiences, you know, build relationships with that collector or fan, you know? So it's like really interesting, but like, I feel like the one of one is also very, again, it's rare, it's unique. It's like a niche, right? Whereas as additions, it's more inclusive and you can kind of build it out with like a community or collectors or whatever your intentions are. If you want to create an experience and you want more people to be a part of it, that's a good way to, to use the additions. And and with like making it more unique, would, would you do that by just like offering that song specifically, like when you offer a one-to-one? -one? So this is kind of, this is a rabbit hole, but I'm like super interested. Yeah, yeah, sure. Let's say you have a song and you want to release it as an NFT. And can you release like a one-to-one -one version that in some way is more unique than let's say you re release an additional 24 versions? Like, is it the uniqueness does it come from the song does it come from the relationship aspect does it come from the artwork or can it be a combination or any of those three things yeah i think it could be a combination i think it's like a scarcity play um i have seen some people that they'll do the one of one and then they'll do the additions but a lot of people feel like that kind of dilutes the value of the one of one so like for me i've done one of ones to like songs that are very special to me or like they've been like my best performing songs or whatever it may be um, and then I've been playing with additions to kind of build out community and stuff like that. So um, I guess it depends on on the way you 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 look at it as, as an artist, right? Like different artists are attempting and trying different, you know, uh, models and stuff like that. And the biggest thing that like why people might want to move into this is because break down, like, let's just break down the streaming, the streaming industry. Yeah. Right. So like an artist is up and coming. Like SoundCloud, I like I remember when Lil Peep was like with back in those days when like Lil Peep was yeah. dropping everything on SoundCloud, then that whole like SoundCloud movement came after him. What artists now are like putting their stuff on Spotify? Like tell tell me more about like that industry and that relationship between Spotify and the artist and how like the music web three scene can like be yeah, a can solve can like solve for a lot of the pain points that are felt there. Yeah, I love this. Um, there's an image. It kind of shows like over the decades how the value of music has declined. So like you had the vinyl, it was like $30, $20, and you had cassettes, CDs, $10, $15, and then like digital downloads were $0.99. Cents, and then you had like now it's streaming. The the artist gets like uh, 0.00397 is the average that you get seen, you know, you see thrown around, um, which is basically for like every million streams, it's about three to $4,000. Sometimes it could be less depending on the average because a lot of times um, it depends on the, on the model. So like there's freemium and then there's premium. There's like, it's by region as well. So different markets have different economics and they do a lot of promotions. Like for example, in Mexico or Latin America, even Asia, I believe um, they'll do like, for example, when you see the promotion, you know, uh, 99 cents for three months, right? So like the actual, like you'll see 999 for a streaming service but the actual, the average revenue per user is actually like way less. Like it's like 50, 100% less than what's being advertised. So that's, it's all a market share play. It's a pool of money. And depending on how you stream, when you stream and all that, it gets distributed. So, you know, of course the majors, they have the deeper catalogs. So, you know, they have the bet, they have the higher market share. So they're going to be earning more, right. Than, than the, than the average um, for artists. It's interesting because I, I personally, it's, it's actually, you know, in the numbers, like independent artists, DIY artists have actually been taking market share in the, in the music industry because of Spotify. So, um, you know, SoundCloud, Spotify, those, those DSPs, I see them like 
like a discovery and distribution platform, right? Like it may not be the place where you're going to earn like this life-changing amount of money to continue building out your business. It could, but maybe not. Right. So like, that's, that's what I like about what's happening now. We're kind of innovating, we're creating new models, new platforms to experiment with, to, you know, hopefully the artists can sustain a living and get paid fairly and equitably, you know? That's a really interesting point. Cause like you're saying a distribution platform. So right. there, I have two questions. The first is why would a DIY artist, why are those types of artists taking? Cause there, you remember like, I don't know, this is maybe just me like miss miss correctly like quoting this but like when i listen to rap songs back maybe like when i was in high school 10 years ago they would be like yeah. i'm getting signed to a label like when chief keef got signed to a label it was like a big deal right. and now artists are like kind of hyping themselves up because they're independent and that's like the the thing you want to be now is that what you mean by like the diy artists like taking market share like these independent artists are taking market share away from the artists that are signed on labels hundred percent. And it's been happening for some time now, like a few years, actually. And the, like the data supports it and backs it. And like, you know, I feel like I'm an artist in that class. That's also seen like at least some kind of success. Right. Because like I've been through a couple different stages. I went through like I used to pirate my own music. So I would like pay. I remember paying like a promotion group and uh, they would put it up on blogs and forums and I would pay like two, three hundred dollars so people could download my music for free. But that was a way to get discovered or get like known, you know. Um, then I did digital downloads that didn't really work for me. That was like catering to like the 1%. So in my opinion, I feel like streaming opened it up a bit, you know, because it allowed for artists to get playlisted and get discovered and things like that. And that, that's actually what happened to me. You know, I, I wanted discovery. I was like, my music is good, but like, it was hard to kind of get that traction and discovery and, and Spotify kind of enabled that for me. But over the, over time, I felt like that pressure and it's been harder and harder to get like more opportunities and, and stuff like that on the on those dsps okay okay understood and then from a discovery standpoint so you use the streaming service as a yeah. way to get discovered and then potentially make a living in other aspects so like merch sales or touring or, or shows and things of that nature is that how like the relationship with streaming works for a lot of like artists who aren't like bad bunny or lil wayne per right. se hundred percent. Yeah. And, and okay. even some of those artists, they kind of use that to translate it and they translate it into those opportunities. Right. And like, I feel like music NFTs are part of that, right? Like they're kind of like that ancillary revenue. That's what they call it in the music industry. So merch touring and like, the, it's kind of like a commerce play in a way for a lot of artists, you know, and then there's also that like direct to fan relationship. Like uh, I always say, I think over the last five years, I, I reached 7 million listeners on Spotify. So unique listeners I've reached over that amount of time. And I don't have access to any of them. I, I don't know who any of them are, <laughs> you know, unless they followed me on Instagram or, or wherever it may be. Like even Spotify, they have a follower count, but like you can't click into it. Like it's literally just a number. Like <laughs> it's kind of crazy, but that's that's yeah. another reality. You know? The worst thing about this, the Spotify follower thing is like I'll follow an artist and like I thought the expectation was like when they drop new music, I would get a push notification from Spotify. But that like I've never yeah. like I've had that maybe happen like two or three times. Yeah, so exactly, exactly. that totally makes sense. So music, music NFTs, they're that ancillary, 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 ancillary. Is that how you say it? Yeah, they call it like ancillary revenues. It's like supplements, right? Okay. Secondary sort of thing. But it's, it's giving you, I've seen Cooper Turley tweet this out a few times and he's like obviously super big in the music NFT space, but he's like said, yeah. you need to have like a hundred collectors versus a million listeners, right? It's like, so explain a little right. bit like what that, what that means. Like how does yeah, selling yeah. a music NFT benefit, benefit the artist from like an economic standpoint, because crypto is the thing driving that. So how is like crypto and music NFTs like driving? Yeah, that's, that, uh, yeah. that's, that's the most exciting part. Like for me, it was a few things. Like I, I did that crowdfund and I did it to raise capital to basically fund and accelerate like this album that I'm rolling out right now. And it's doing well, you know, and I've been pushing that. Yeah, I got a couple of years of experience on me and all that. But like, that was a, a big deal, right? Like, I didn't have to go to a label. I didn't have to go to a bank, which is like really, really difficult, right? Like, which by the way, like I'm, I'm independent more like on, on purpose. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not out there trying to get a deal. A lot of people ask me like, are you trying to get a deal? Why don't you get a deal? Why don't you sign to this and that? And I'm like, eh, like, it's not really what I want to do. So that was my way of, of kind of raising that money to then, you know, put this album out, you know? So it's like, to me, the crowdfunding aspect is like an amazing use case. And then kind of using the NFTs as a tool and the platforms to kind of innovate on that front. I think that's like a really good idea. And I think that 
for me, what I've learned is like a, a lot of people talk about the hundred fans, but like a lot of people think that it's literal like fans, but it could be a combination of a lot of different people. It could be, you know, your collaborators, it could be a super fan, it could be a collector, it could be an investor, it could be a developer. I mean, there's like a lot of people that could be within this group that then help you kind of reach, you know, hopefully what your milestones and where you want to get to. So that's the way that I'm looking at it. So it's like a quality versus quantity play. Um, I, I still think there's potential in, you know, discovery and having listeners and, and all of that, because like, if you do reach that, like you're going to generate royalties, you're going to have some kind of cash flow coming in and you can use that to keep expanding and building, you know? Um, so there's a few different ways I look at it. I'm, you know, I'm still learning, but it's definitely more of like a basically quality versus quantity. Yeah, for sure. And then from like a, from like a purchaser standpoint, like these are obviously not things where the artist is like, yo, I'm going to sell this NFT and then like, you're going to make money because of it. Right. It's just like, I'm selling you this music and you're going to, you get to be an individual collector, but from like an investment perspective, if per se, that artist goes on to have like a hit album, then those NFTs by the fact that the artist is getting more exposure and more people know about them worldwide, then the NFTs would then from a secondary market perspective would like increase in value. Yeah. Like there's, so there's, there's like an investor benefit. Yeah, exactly. I think there's potential for that, you know, and you were like, you can say you were early and then if the artist tied in any utility or experiences to that NFT, you get, you get that also added, you know, benefit to it. So it, it makes for a really interesting way. And, you know, everything behind the technology, whether it's the splits, um, you know, and all that, like, I think that's, that's really powerful as well. Yeah. Cause that's like the, that's like the shittiest thing, man. Like I, I, so I like, it was super into SoundCloud and I remember, did you listen to good music all day? Like back in like 2010? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I was yeah, on SoundCloud. Good music, like, yeah, G Man and stuff like that. And <laughs> yeah. I, I remember I listened to G Easy's first mixtape. What was it called? Uh, That's it was crazy. the one before the one before endless summer, right? It was before yeah, endless I summer, which was like, I can't remember it. it the song waspy was on it. And dude, yeah. if I could have bought a music NFT of that song, like, could you just imagine like how much that would be worth right now? Like that's yeah, kind of, like I, the cool, th yeah. 100%. I discovered a lot of artists that way. Like The Weeknd was actually called The Noise when he first came out. And I discovered him like on a blog randomly, you know, and like now he's like one of the world's biggest artists. Bruno Mars, I remember yeah. finding a demo of his very early, like before he even blew up. So, you know, I, I love that concept as well of discovering yeah. early and that proof of discovery is pretty cool. Yeah, Black Bear was Matt Misto. He he released music yeah. under like his his like his like legal name before he like right. became Black Bear. Yeah, it's like it's like I remember all these things. I was like, and it's like six years later, I was like, fuck, man, everyone's like super famous now. Like that's so cool. Yeah. But it's 100%. also like, yeah, it's like following that, right? Cool. So let's you you mentioned earlier how different markets. Let's let's and let's you and I both like you're obviously from Latin America, and I, like I spend yeah. a lot of time in Latin America. So let's just like focus on that region specifically. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The markets are different. So is there a way that like being a, a DIY up and coming artist in the United States, it, from my understanding and from what I've read, that will pay you better per stream than it will for someone who is, let's say, in the Dominican Republic or Mexico? Like you're going to make more in the US than you are versus like Latin America. Yeah. So like, let's, let's just as an example, if, if let's say 100% of my streams were coming from the US, then I'm definitely going to get a better royalty rate than I would if I, you know, if I'm getting paid from like uh, getting streamed down in Mexico. So like uh, Mexico was actually considered like the streaming Mecca of the world. So more people were streaming music in Mexico than anywhere else in the world. That was a few years back. I don't know if it's changed uh, for my genre. So like reggaeton, like uh, they're considering Ch uh, Santiago, Chile, the same thing. Like it's like the capital of reggaeton because of streaming. So because the market's different, the economics, like, all the consumption is so different, like they approach it differently. And that's why I've, I kind of still use DSPs to my advantage to kind of keep growing and get that discovery. And maybe over time I can continue to, you know, that compound growth, I can keep onboarding my super friends that I kind of keep, you know, uh, building over time, you know, that that would be like the, the goal. Okay. And then how, so, so do you think though, from a standpoint of like, let's just say like economic equality from that standpoint, do yeah. you think that like just because of the nature of crypto is borderless do you so do you think having different markets paying out different streaming rates is a negative thing or a positive thing i don't know i, th I think it's like it's interesting because it's almost like it's something that's not in in the control of the artist like we have no say right like it's it's mostly mm -hmm. like 
the big tech platforms and the labels kind of making those decisions. So it's tricky. They're, they're experimenting with different models like user centric pay, which is basically like if you're streaming me, then the subscription money that you're paying them, that's going to go to me and to the people that you're listening to. So that okay, could be an interesting That's pretty interesting. Model. Yeah, I think SoundCloud is officially doing that. And uh, Deezer, I believe, is another one that's doing that. So rather than yeah. your money getting distributed amongst people you don't even listen to, it's kind of like who you're following and who you're supporting, which again, like NFTs is very user-centric pay. It's it's one-to-one, -one, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you think that, do you think that there's going to be a chance where like, within like Web3 specifically, like people a lot of the time will say like it evens the playing field for creators? Like, do you, do you view that like a lot of up and coming artists, cause it's all, it's all in its infancy, right? This is very, like, we're very early in all of this. So do you think, like, let's, let's zoom out like 10 years, right? Yeah. Do you think in 10 years, if you're an artist, you're 17, 18 years old, you're, you're, you're trying to get, like get into the reggaeton scene in like Puerto Rico. Like, yeah. do you think music NFTs are going to be an avenue for those like artists to leverage? Like, do you think that digital economy is going to expand? Like, is everyone going to be doing this when they're up and coming? They might not sell out. They might not sell every NFT they mint. But like, right. is it something that people are regularly can like be pursuing? Yeah, I think so. I think, I think it's scalable. Like I, I think because again, we're so early, like in the future, a, a sound drop could possibly be, you know, let's say a thousand editions at $20 or, you know, whatever that is in ETH. And I feel like that's scalable and that's more doable for your average person to, to get involved in, you know, like right now it's very native, like crypto native friendly. Um, and I think like over time, we're going to see more people kind of using it and, and, it may not even be called NFTs. It may be something else. It may just be the platform, right? Like a lot of people don't don't know how Spotify works under the hood. They're just using it. And like, it may be like more like, like I remember seeing like no code, like marketplaces growing and I leveraged that, you know, I was able to build a website. I was able to build a, a, a merch store, like super easy, you know, like within a couple of days, right? I didn't have to pay 10, $15,000 <laughs> like, like it was back in the day. So like, I think the same thing is going to happen where the, the, the cost of entry is going to lower the learning curve might be a little easier, you know, and it, it's, it could be scalable And that again, that direct to fan relationship, that community idea is, is super key. That's why I think it's more of a, of a mindset, you know, a mental model that I think a lot of artists should start at least thinking about it. Right. Think about ownership. Think about not calling like people like uh, consumers and not calling the music a product. Right. Like if, if we start kind of changing those terms as well, I think that helps a lot, you know. I've I've had that conversation a few times with with a couple of people like, you know, like a lot of the labels right now they're content houses, right? It's not even about music, it's about putting out as much content as they can and monetizing that. You know, and and that can get saturated very quickly. And there's also like this and again, I'm not in the music. I've no knowledge of this, but from my understanding, like it encourages a lot of artists to put out like subpar music. Yeah, hundred percent. It's happens. like if if you're just like in a content house, it's like yo, we need five albums over the next six years, and you're like, well, they're not like not every artist can like put out five albums over, like yeah, yeah like yeah. it's just not everyone can do that. I've seen I've seen an incredible artists do that, and then they get kind of like they dilute their sound, and like they're like they're like very well known, but like you can tell the people are starting to notice, and like mm -hmm. there's a decline there, and then the next artist kind of comes up, and it's because of that. Instead of them taking it, you know, little by little, they're kind of just like trying to monetize the hell out of the artists and, and the content and like they get yeah. burnt out. You know? it's, it's unfortunate, yeah. but I totally get that. Well, let's, let's shift gears here. Cause yeah. that, that like, I love that conversation. That's super interesting, but like, let's shift gears. Let's focus on, on like you individually, you're leading, like, in my opinion, like I've followed your journey. Like I think via Twitter, like know you relatively well and probably know you better than most people that like, I'm, I'm like Twitter, Twitter friends with, I guess you could call it yeah, that. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. And you're leading, in my opinion, you're kind of like leading LATAM artists, Latin American artists within the Web3 um, ecosystem. Like what in terms of like educating new artists who are coming into this space and like you're finding Latin artists and like trying like, is there a mentorship aspect of this? Like just generally talk about like the relationships that you have with other artists in the space from the Latin American community. Yeah, for sure. So I, I can start off by saying like I was I always say I was doing it before Web3. So why not do it now, right? Where I'm in like a different position, right? And people are kind of perceiving me as a, as a leader in a space, like you just said. And you no, know, I don't want to take that for granted. So for me, it's always been, I've helped a lot of songwriters and producers understand the music business and it changed their lives, you know? And I expected nothing in return for, for doing that. You know, a lot of them are my collaborators to this day. 
so I guess that's kind of the way that we still have that that relationship. And you know, um, a lot of the artists that I've helped from Latin America, they were kind of getting taken advantage by, uh, you know, stateside, right? Like they didn't know that they had royalty sitting in like this cloud and then they weren't able to claim that. And I helped a lot of them understand it, claim that money and that money, of course, you know, down, down in Latin America because of the economics, it, it stretches out for them. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, kind of doing the same thing right in, in this space. And I think it's more important because it's a new technology. It's, it's like a new, everything, right. New industry, new economy. And I feel like we, no, no one should be kind of left behind in a way, right. Like at least, kind of give them and spark that inspiration and, and have them kind of, again, back to the mental model, the mindset, like kind of shifting that. And if I can kind of spread that awareness uh, to those artists, producers, songwriters, you know, I'm not limiting myself to who I'm helping. And what I've noticed is that at least on the music side, there's not a lot of traction in Latin America. I've actually been invited to a lot of spaces to talk music NFTs and uh, they're more familiar with like art NFTs or PFP collections. So at least I could say on the music side, I'm definitely kind of focusing on that and, and pushing, hopefully I can keep pushing that forward. Heck yeah, man. No, dude, I, I, I'm like super stoked. Cause I just think from a, just like from a fan perspective, cause you know, I don't know, like that's how I learned Spanish. So like pe people, <laughs> like I speak fluent Spanish. People actually, it, I'm white, have no Spanish speaking relatives, but I speak it fluently and how I learned it was like, I remember the first song was um, by Arcangel, Me Prefieres a Mi, that song. Yeah, remember that like, way back in the day? Like I would, I would listen to that on repeats. So what I would do is like, I would listen to these reggaeton songs when I was like 16, 17. And then I would read the lyrics and then I would like pair the words I was listening to the lyrics. And then I would like translate them. And like, that's how I like taught yeah. myself Spanish. And so like seeing like, so I have this like affinity for reggaeton and then like seeing like, it kind of crossover now into crypto, which is like something else I'm like super passionate about. I like, for me, it's just like, I don't know. It's, it's like this kind of like nostalgic moment where you kind of see you're, you're at the Genesis, right? And like, you probably feel that way if it's like a, from a creator perspective, like from a fan, like it's awesome. Like I can't even imagine what it's like, like being a creator kind of like leading that drive. I don't, yeah, just from like a nostalgia perspective, you, you might look back on this in like 20 years and be like, holy shit. Like that was, that was pretty percent. Even till now I'm like, I'm like, damn, I'm like, I'm a reggaeton artist this deep down the rabbit hole in crypto web three, like <laughs> I would have never imagined yeah. that. Like I had yeah. an idea, like I, I felt it, you know, I was like, like I wanted to explore experiment in the space, but a lot of things mm -hmm. were holding me back and, you know, I, you know, I made it happen. So it's something I really manifested. And that's why it's like any naysayers or skeptics. I'm like, listen, I, I, I was in like 2018 trying to figure this out. And then I made it happen a couple years later. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. That's awesome. So like, let's go back to 2018. Like why, why did you originally get into crypto? Like you, you mentioned experimenting, like you don't have to dive into every specific example, but like, why'd you get into crypto? Like what was the initial interest? Yeah, for me, it was definitely like, you know, I came across Bitcoin very early on, like 2013, 2014, around there. Um, I know my, my brother had some and like his friends had some cause they were like developers and engineers. So I remember them talking about it and like, I've had my Coinbase account since like forever, but I, I rarely had any Bitcoin. I probably had like $30 worth. Um, and then I kind of ignored it. And then, yeah, 2016, I like I mentioned earlier, I, that's when I got into blockchain and smart contracts, even though Bitcoin is built on a blockchain. But for some reason, that's when I got into it. And yeah, see, I saw a lot of pioneers, like uh, there was Image and Heap, there was RAC, Grammatic did a fundraiser at the time. That was the ICO era. So I'm like, damn, artists are kind of building without the need of a of a traditional, you know, major label. You know, they're getting the funding that they need and they're building a community. So all of that resonated with me as an independent artist. So I'm like, damn, I'm, I'm already in crypto. You know, I got in mostly because of like this idea of like financial and economic freedom. Like that's really what like got into it. I'm into investing. I'm into finance. So like this was like it was very natural for me to kind of like tap into it as, a, as an asset class, you know. Um, and yeah, from there, I just like kept growing and learning and, and building everything out really. No, heck, yeah, I can appreciate that, especially like the financial, the economic freedom part. Like, like let's go, let's go to that. Like you're from, and again, like, I, I think everyone has different experiences. So I like want to like, again, this is all personal experiences, but for me, like I yeah. have experiences in my life where I've lived in different parts of the world and like the economic freedom aspect of crypto, like the not needing to rely on like on 
central governments or especially if you're like for example in the middle east they have something called migrant workers so you'll come from another country you'll work in a, a gulf a gulf state country where they have like a lot of oil revenues etc and you don't really have a lot of rights like they'll take your passport when you get there you have to see out you can't leave until you see out your contract it's all kind of messed up yeah. and then you kind of see the way that the financial system is really a, like it's massively a part of all that like tell me more like from an economic freedom standpoint like your personal experiences there if, if you don't mind sharing and kind of yeah, how sure. you can yeah like how, how it all kind of ties together there yeah i would love to because it's refreshing so like I'm, I'm i was born in puerto rico so i'm puerto rican but i'm also half cuban um half cuban from my dad's side and they basically they went through the cuban revolution so you know they experienced that firsthand they lived that um and at the time like basically just to sum, sum it up like you know assets were seized properties were seized and they basically, I remember my grandfather, he was actually in prison for some time over there. And uh, basically the final sort of straw was the idea that when anyone turned 16, at least men or boys, they had to go to war. They had to enlist in the army and go to Russia to fight the war at the time. And that was kind of like the final kind of straw for my, for my family. And um, I remember them telling me the stories and everything. And this idea of like, there was a, a lottery system back in the day. So like Castro would allow people to kind of decide if they wanted to leave the country. Um, they didn't get out that first time. So that was a lot of people that went to Miami, um, but they had a lottery system and every now and then people were like, you can opt out and, and leave. And so my family uh, migrated to Puerto Rico. So that's kind of like, it's, it's, it's not as common to find like a, a half Cuban, half Puerto Rican. It's actually, it's interesting whenever I find someone and they're half Cuban and half Puerto Rican, it's like, oh, like, you know, there's another one of us. Um, but yeah, I feel like that's why I naturally leaned into crypto. So for me, it wasn't just like, I'm not a trader. So like, I don't trade, I don't swing trade, day trade, none of that stuff. So like, that really resonated with me, this idea that, you know, I, I can tap into an emerging asset class, there's an alternative, there's an option there. Um, and, and all of that is really interesting to me. And I, I think I subconsciously leaned into it because of what my family went through. Yeah, and like, it's just like, if you go through like asset forfeiture, like that, that's, I don't think people in... <laughs> like I would say like, like European and, and North American, in North American, meaning like the United States and Canada, like yeah. we don't, we don't understand that. Like, we don't know anything about that. Right. Like that's just 100%. like a wild concept that the government's going to be like, Oh no, that business you built for the last 30 years, like that's not yours anymore. Yeah. It's, it's, and yeah, they literally seized property assets. Um, they lived off of rations. So, you know, they told me stories of them living off a bar of soap between a family of eight. Uh, having a pound of meat a month, you know, like those things like that. That's why they instilled a lot of like, you know, discipline, work ethic in me and stuff like that, because they had to leave and yeah. start from scratch, start from zero. Imagine them having the opportunity to maybe opt out of that system, convert assets potentially, you know, and then once they started from wherever, they can access that. And then kind of like, they would have had an easier time. Same with a lot of people that left Venezuela. You know, I have a lot of friends that they were living around the world, jumping from country to country because of what happened in Venezuela, you know? And again, same thing, you know, this was more modern. So it makes more sense that if they would have had an alternative and option, then that would have probably helped them kind of sustain themselves during that transition, that process. Yeah. It's kind of like, so like for everyone, like in the West, like, like in, in not the West, but like, like North America generally, I'll just tell them like, yeah, you should have like a couple paychecks worth a Bitcoin or Zcash or whatever, because yeah. You never know, like you just never know when like shit hits the yeah, fan. No. Like you, you, you have to like go to somewhere else and like you, you, that'll be the way that you transact with other people, right? Yeah, it's yeah, like building crazy. those relationships. And I, I, my family, I can still tell they have that PTSD. You know, when anything happens, like government wise or like protests or whatever it may be, like they have this PTSD of like shit's gonna hit the fan, something's gonna happen. Like you know, like yeah. they're always telling me, hey, be careful. Like hey, do you, are you working? Do you got a job? <laughs> You know, they kind of put that pressure, you know, it's like the immigrant, I have that immigrant bug DNA of just like being on top of it and, and all that. So yeah. yeah, it's really interesting. And, and you wrote it, you wrote a, you wrote an article kind of like describing all of these things and a thing you mentioned, and obviously like the, the space that I'm in and the people who would potentially listen to this uh, for the most part will, are probably of that space. Privacy. How does, cause obviously with like Bitcoin, Ethereum, most, I would say the majority of like blockchain cryptocurrency, like systems operate on like transparent ledgers. So how, 
how does privacy like factor into this? Like, for, like, let's start with you personally, and then like your opinions on just like a broader scale. Like, why does privacy matter in this ecosystem? Yeah, for sure. You know, to me, it's like a basic like human right. You know, and I think it's underrated right now because I feel as we continue to transition into like this digital world, like we're kind of taking it for granted, and our privacy, like, it's kind of like kind of decimating. It's kind of disappearing. But you know, I would say that I've, I've noticed people kind of. Like uh, there's the old like meme of like you you mention something and then your phone is advertising you that product or whatever it is and that's kind of like that lights a, a you know a sparks a light bulb there like you're kind of like wait like why is this happening how is this happening why is it so difficult for me to turn this off and and not have my you know phone tap into my home and what I'm listening to and all of that so like I, I'm kind of glad that that's in the narrative now and people are kind of thinking about it but it is something that's really kind of taken for granted i feel in this like digital world that we're in this connected always on demand world and i think like financial privacy is important like you know people are being persecuted and things like that and like again like migrating from one country to another like you want the privacy you know like you never know like what's happening who's keeping track who's keeping tabs and things like that so i think there's a lot of value there and, and i hope that you know as we keep like digitizing that people kind of think about that you know in their like in their lives you know no, 100%. And then like, how do you think like, from that, like building on that, like, how do you think potentially, because like, minute, like, I think I've, I've said it publicly about you, like when you had your drop on sound, like I, I mentioned that you're, like, you're a fan of Zcash. So like, how do you think potentially like Zcash could like fit into this ecosystem? And do you think just from, you know, like we were talking about earlier, like, like, before, before we got on and before we started recording, like, we're, neither of us, are, we're not engineers, but like we relatively, like we understand the fundamentals behind this all like relatively right. well. So like, how do you see from like a non-technical perspective Zcash fitting into like this broader crypto ecosystem? Yeah, I think um, it's definitely more of, a, of an asset play, maybe for people that are into finance, investing, like store value, preserving capital. Um, so I think that's why it's like, it's like on its own little like world and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, but for me, it's like, if, if you we're already in this digital world, like I love this idea of like optional privacy through an asset like Zcash. Um, and yeah. what, what really got in, what got me into it was that this idea of optional privacy, I remember having conversations. And I remember when like a, a lot of the, the private, the privacy coins were being delisted, but Zcash stayed right on these like big exchanges and platforms and things like that. And I thought that that was like, super interesting and it kind of reinforced this thesis of like shielded transactions have value and i think that yeah. a lot of people will find value in in that concept that idea yeah you, like you bring up a super good point because i don't know like and maybe i'm gonna get yelled at for this but i think like t like so zcash has two addresses right for people who don't know that has the private privacy private address the shielded address and the transparent address which is public like bitcoin and transparent addresses like kind of mimic bitcoin right but right. in these Z, in these Zcash wallets now, like some of the mobile wallets, you can because like on Coinbase, you cannot withdraw to a shielded address. You can only do transparent right. to transparent. But with yeah. Coinbase, you can withdraw to your transparent address, and then you can shield it in the wallet. In Coinbase or whoever, and no, they have no, they don't know what your shielded address is. They don't know where, like, they can't see your funds once you shield them. And like, as long as you're doing it like relatively consistently, and you're not just like spot buying Zcash, like just in case you need it and you're kind of like built, storing up a lot of value in it. The privacy, even if you're like using Coinbase, like the privacy features, if you're withdrawing and then shielding your assets, if you want to choose that option, it's, it's like, it's still really strong. So I think there's a narrative out there that like transparent addresses are like inherently bad, which right, right. if you use them and like, and that's something like I'm trying to work on like with people right now, trying to share that, like, Hey, this is actually a really effective way to like use Zcash and like get it like, crossing from Ethereum using a bridge to Zcash. Like I did that. I saw that. Like oh, a yeah. Ago. Yeah. It's like you use transparent addresses and then you shield it in the wallet. And then there's no, like that money shielded. It's completely private. Right. Um, yeah. Super interesting concept. I'm really, I'm really glad you, you, you brought that up because I think a lot of people lose sight of that at times. Right. Like lose sight of like optional privacy. Cause like, for like you, you mentioned the privacy coins, like all spinning up and getting delisted. Like, when you were like kind of researching, was that when you first learned about Z, uh, Zcash, was it, oh, I don't know how I feel about this optional privacy or was it more of like a natural where it just clicked for you? Like, did you, were you initially more drawn to things like Monero or was it like you were always more interested in Zcash? 
definitely more interested in Zcash. And like, of course, I went from like deep diving into Bitcoin. And of course, I started following the fork. So mm-hmm. Monero, Zcash, Grin, Horizon, I think Decred, I, I think that's how you pronounce it. It's like another fork yeah, off of so. Bitcoin. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I leaned into Zcash because of that. It was an optional privacy thing. And I'm like, in the future, if something were to go down, then like, there's still a potential use there, right? Because, you know, you can use a transparent address if needed or if you want. Um, not that I have anything against the other sort of, you know, models like Monero and things like that. But I I, I imagine the world where like what happened with Tornado Cash is very similar. Like you kind of saw it coming, right? <laughs> and that's kind of how like when I discovered Zcash, why I kind of leaned more into it. Um, and that yeah. was like 2018 as well. Like, I, I don't know why I was like, tapping into every single sector possible in crypto like i, I really went down the <laughs> the, well, the rabbit hole. that's a that's a good thing right like because you you un- you understand all these like i feel like zcash it's just another tool in the toolbox right like right, i right. have tons of different tools in the toolbox that i use for different things and they all have different use cases and i like i'm not a like i think maximalism kind of like destroys all of that but like with zcash yeah, yeah. for normal people hey like get get it 500 bucks put it in a shielded wallet and just don't touch it and like if you ever need Nothing to use like <laughs> a private transaction then you then you have it like it's it's there like in hopefully it over time it appreciates in value whatever like yeah it's just a tool in a toolbox 100 percent, 100 percent. i'm with that yeah i think a lot of stuff so, kind of reinforces my thesis over time you know like do you get that intuition yeah. in, in place yeah, and I, I'm interested to see how, like, you know, like Zcal, like, busy stuff going on, like, from a technical perspective. And it's going to be cool to see how, like, those things play out in, like, the next two to three years. But I think just kind of understanding, hey, like, especially, like, with the cross-chain communities, like, I, I'm really mm-hmm. interested in, like, working with a lot of Ethereans, because obviously, like, Zuko's going on Bankless, like, working with oh, Ethereans nice. and, like, telling, like, hey, like, you can bridge, you can tri- you can swap eth for zach right. on uniswap and then you can bridge it over into a shielded wallet like i think that use case in itself like hey just have 500 bucks there just have a little stash just in case you need it is like a great way to like intro people to different projects as well yeah i've seen it so, of course because it, what's happened in the narrative zcash has been a lot more in the spotlight you know and a lot of people are talking about like you mentioned like the bridging the cross-chain stuff either with cosmos i saw you posted about ren um and then like yeah, Co- yeah is, cosmos like, is something that like i think the team's looking at yeah 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 exactly so like that's another one that i kind of dive dive d- deep into and obviously yeah. the change the proof sure. of stake which I'm, I'm not too sure i know that's a few years out but like again that was interesting as well for me to to, to see yeah the change to proof of stake i think I mean, I, I like, I worked on like that research, like I didn't work on the research, but I like worked on like a lot of the, the comms around that. Right. So I, I, I kind of, I kind of like have the in there, so I don't want to talk about it yeah. too much, but <laughs> like, it's definitely like in its research stage and, and yeah, if it, if it, if it's something the community like broader Zcash community like wants to do, then like, I'd say maybe let's say like two, three years, maybe, I don't right. know. I've actually never asked for like a, for a timeline, but I, yeah. That's, that's we'll the see. estimate. I, I think the, <laughs> Yeah, let's just let's just see how it all plays out with Ethereum, and I think everyone after the merge happens with Ethereum will all have sure. like better ideas on like if you wanted to like move from proof of work to proof of stake. But the last thing I wanted to talk to you about is because I think Zcash, there's a lot of like talk around kind of utilizing the energy, of the community, like how can we get more community members involved in certain projects? How can we? get people i mean like yourself who are in different crypto crypto ecosystems but you're okay. you're interested in zcash and you find it you know you find this like project really compelling how how do you think about like education like how do you feel like where do you think zcash could potentially improve in terms of education or just like the broader crypto ecosystem in general like i think you're you do an amazing job of like building communities in web3 and in like crypto and in all in this entire like sphere so how do you think about that? How do you think about like educating people who might not know anything, who might not know something about like a certain protocol or a certain project that you're working on? Like, how do you think about that? Yeah, I think that that's kind of what inspired that piece I wrote um, because I kind of wanted to touch on stuff outside of the creator economy and stuff that I'm kind of passionate about or interested in. And like, that was kind of the idea behind that. I didn't really push it that much, but like lately I've been noticing a lot of stuff and I kind of want more creators to tap into overall ownership. So this idea of like, financial risk management, like really tapping into that. Cause I feel like that's a big part of the entire crypto like ecosystem. Right. So like, why not explore 
outside of the creator economy and those tools and kind of dive in a little more into like investing in assets and, you know, preserving your capital and, and potentially growing it in the space as well, you know? So like, I feel like I'm treading lightly because I don't want to push coins or tokens or like financial advice. Um, but it's something I definitely been thinking about. And like someone hit me up about like doing something about like financial literacy, maybe. I think a lot of like creators can probably learn from that, you know, because the crash affected a lot of people. They had to change plans or whatnot because the value of ETH kind of went down, you know, for example, um, and the treasury started going down and that happened to bigger projects. So imagine creators, which have, yeah, for sure. treasuries, you know? Yeah, it's like when ETH, if like you if you did a sound sellout and you raise like eight ETH at like four grand and you got like seventy five percent of that, I don't like I don't know what the percentages are, but like let's say seventy five percent, and then that yeah. value drops like nine like eighty percent in like what a month that like for a lot yeah. of people that's like a shock and that's like when and that's the same thing with Zcash right like someone gets in at Zcash when I started working at ECC six months ago and it was at $200 and you put a fat stack of money in, now it's at like trading at 70. Like pe if people don't know why these right. things are volatile and why they go up and down like that, then they don't understand. Then they, the value of that's like completely diminished because people either want to preserve money, see it appreciate against the dollar, which has its, you know, has its negative qualities and like, or they want to yeah. make money, right? Like, so the financial literacy aspect, I think is super important too. You know, that's a really cool thing sure. you mentioned there. Yeah, I think, I think that would be, interesting to bring into the creator narrative you know like i remember working some seminars and like athletes saying like hey i made 80 million dollars in career earnings and i lost it all you know like that's insane to even think yeah. about like you can't even like <laughs> comprehend something like that and it's happened to artists too that go bankrupt or they're in debt then they go and sign another deal to get another loan on top of that loan and like you know i don't want to see creators going through that again when the idea of like a lot of this is potentially financial and economic freedom and empowerment yeah and then how do you think so zcash a lot of people look at it as like a grandfather like science project what do you think the yeah. most if i was if i was to go to a, a music nft meetup in new york and like let's say there's one in three weeks and i had 10 minutes to kind of like tell them why they should swap some of their eth for zach and then move it to a shielded wallet um, via bridge what do you think like the most compelling reason to do that is i think I want to say just off the top, like diversifying, if they have a treasury or it's like a personal portfolio, I think diversifying is never a bad thing. Like you're, you know, it's the old saying, like, you know, you concentrate, you, you know, your wealth to protect it, you know, or diversify to protect it, concentrate to kind of grow your wealth out. So yeah. I, I want to say kind of leaning into that, um, diversifying, I, I think that would be the way, right? And like this idea of mm -hmm. privacy, like you're kind of used to seeing you know, these like trans like public kind of transactions happening, you know, on Etherscan, you can see who's collected from who and like that, that, that serves its purpose and it holds value, but that could be a way to kind of tell them like, Hey, this is a way for you to preserve some capital privately. You know, that, that could be a compelling yeah. sort of use case for them. And I think the other thing too, is like, and again, like NFA, right? Not financial advice, but like, if you look yeah. at it from like a perspective of, and I know that a lot of people in Zcash, this is kind of a debate going on right now. Like, should we care about the value of Zek, like the asset, right? And for me, one, if you're using something as a store of value, like you want the value of that asset to appreciate, right? And I think what people don't understand, this is something like Zuko and I um, have talked about a lot, is that if you use Zek, like if you, if you take Zek, if you take Ethereum and you put it into the shielded pool in Zcash, the Zcash blockchain, and then you just like send it to another, like you, and then you kind of like take it out a day later to just send it to another Ethereum address via the bridge, you're not actually getting that level of privacy that people think they're getting. Like for right. privacy, think of it as like using cash, right? If you go to the ATM and you take out 150 bucks and then you spend 150 bucks somewhere, like there's like, like people don't think about this, but there's like surveillance cameras and there's all this shit that's like tracking you with like phone right. location data and that, yeah, it's like traceability. So you're creating that pattern. So for like a store of value being the best way and then using payments sparingly or like when you need to from a privacy standpoint is the best way to like secure privacy. Then diversifying like what you just mentioned, diversifying into Zach and using it as like a private store of value. Like that is one of its better use cases because if it, if the value of it can appreciate and people can have a private asset in a time that they might need it, I think like that is like 
probably for me, one of the more compelling use cases as well, like this private store value that appreciates over time. And if I ever need to use it, I can't, and it's yeah, not 100%. gone like, cause of the value depreciates, you can't use it. Right. Right. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Yeah. Coming up, coming up on like coming up close to an hour here. Uh, I know we had that allotted. So before, you know, diving into anything else or, or parting ways, want to ask, is there anything that I didn't ask you that you would want to wanted to have talked about? That's a good one. Honestly, I think we covered a lot, even more so than 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 I expected, to be honest. Yeah. And I hope a lot of if creators watch this, man, hopefully they can get something out of it. Um, and anyone else really, you know, who may be interested in seeing what artists are doing to tap into crypto and blockchain and stuff like that. I think that's also important, you know, and just know that like, even though it's, it's new and it's been happening, like the conversation has been around for about five or six years, you know? So I think that's another key yeah. point. And if, okay, I, I got one more question. If someone yeah. like an artist or whoever, like friend, family hit you up and was like, how do I get into crypto? How do I get into like how do I get my money out? Like, let's say they got into crypto, they got an exchange and now they're seeing like, oh, like, do I need to get a wallet? How do you like guide them through that process of like, okay, you got your money on an exchange. That's cool. Let's get yeah. it off to a wallet so you can actually own it. Like, and then you can further go down technical rabbit holes there. But like, what's the first piece of advice you give someone if they're like trying to move off the yeah. exchange, kind of opt out of like centralized finance? Yeah, I always try to like give them something that they're familiar with and kind of compare it. So like I've used this analogy of like uh, MetaMask being like Cash App, but a Cash App that's not owned necessarily by anyone and that you can kind of connect mm -hmm. to certain applications and do different new things or like it's a different sort of internet with a different set of like rules or ideology. Um, so I kind of bring them into that rabbit hole <laughs> and then they kind of start understanding yeah. like, okay, that's cool. I can connect here and I could potentially either collect an NFT, sell an NFT and kind of start growing. Um, on the finance side, of course, I always kind of direct them to like Aave or like Uniswap, this idea that you can swap or stuff like that. Or Aave, you know, you you can earn interest, you know, or provide liquidity and earn fees and kind of explore there. Um, so I, it depends yeah. on who it is. I'll, I'll kind of like try to like tap, tap them into whatever I feel like they may be of interest, you know, whatever they think is interesting. Okay. I might just kind of show them that. Yeah. Okay, cool. I think the cash app is a... Is really interesting for zcash interesting, the right? one we, yeah the, yeah that's an interesting i like that the one i use a lot is zcash is like if you took eight money out of an atm and you put it in your yeah. wallet that's like zcash and crypto so if you're taking money out of like eth or taking money out of bitcoin and you put it into zcash that's what you're doing right you're putting money in like a physical wallet because right cash is like can't track cash you have to like right. like people have to be actually like watching you and following your movements to know what you're doing with cash but like the cash itself you can't track it so like yeah, it's That's... like the shoebox, you know, it's like, and it's also like anonymous versus pseudonymous. I think I, I kind of use that a few times as well, whenever yeah. I'm talking like deeply with someone about like <laughs> Bitcoin yeah. versus like Zcash or something like that. I kind of use that analogy yeah. as well. For sure. Awesome. Because a lot of people think Bitcoin is anonymous, but you know, not, not, not yeah, really. You know? Yeah. That's, yeah, it, it was for a while, but now like, right, right. that's like, that's changing a lot. So for sure. Awesome. Yeah. Puerto Rico, like. What, what's yeah. the what's your favorite spot let's let's end on that what's your favorite spot to go to in puerto rico like whether it's like going out at night or like chilling like it's a beach you want to chill during the day restaurant like what's your what's your recommendations for anyone yeah i love man so I'm, I'm i'm from caguas so i always mm -hmm. go to caguas i love it there like it's just something about it just kind of going back i love ponce that's kind of where i have you know other family at and i always love the trip from caguas to there just kind of like the highway with yeah. like mountains you it's also like super like you know <laughs> chill um yeah. which is of course food i mean i'll go out there i'm a foodie so i'll go out and then just kind of go to um pinones and just find different places to eat i love seafood so i mean it's perfect like i can't complain anytime i go over there to be honest yeah for sure same here man i can't wait to go back but dude thank you so much for the time i think this was like a super cool conversation to like understand a, a different ecosystem and then also start, understand that human side like why are you from yeah. like a human perspective or like interested in like crypto, Zcash, et cetera. So yeah, thank you so much for your time today, man. Oh, thank you, man. I appreciate it. It was uh, super refreshing to have a, a different convo.